I wonder, as you look back on your life, what would you say have been your regrets? Maybe it's something you said you would never do, or maybe it's something you said you would do, but in the end you just couldn't or you didn't. I wonder, have you ever had a time when you feel like you've completely blown it? Maybe it's something that you're struggling with right now and you just hate for anyone to find out about it. Maybe it's something uh, you've experienced as a teenager or a parent or in your workplace or more broadly as a follower of Jesus. The question is, what do you do with that, that sense of failure? Our society, for all its talk of tolerance, inclusion and recognising and embracing the frailty of our humanity, has little tolerance for those who don't live up to its values at that particular point in time. What has become known as cancel culture is the way that our society punishes the sins of individuals by shaming them and excluding them from participating in social life. The reason I'm telling you this is because even though we might say God is kind and forgiving, the reality is that we fear that he deals with us in the same way our culture does, that if we blow it, there's no way back. So if you're in that place today, hang on because I've got good news for you. We're in a series called Life Before and After the Cross. We've been following the story of Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples. In the story we're going to look at today, we're going to see how Jesus responds to Peter, who has completely blown it. Now, the context for what happens here is so important, so I'm going to do a bit of a recap of what happened up to this point. Now, the evening before Jesus was arrested, he was having dinner with his disciples and he told them that he was leaving them and where he was going, they couldn't follow. Now, Peter's confused and upset and they all are. And Peter says to Jesus, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. In fact, in Mark's gospel, he says, even if everyone else falls away, I will not. I wonder what everyone else there that night thought of that statement. I wonder if you've ever made a promise in the moment and then realised later you really wish you hadn't. Well, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, will you lay down your life for me? Before the cock crows tomorrow morning, you will have denied me three times. It's like, Peter, not only will you not lay down your life for me, but you're going to pretend that you never even knew me. I wonder, how would you have felt if Jesus had said that to you? Jesus' reply must have really shocked Peter because we don't actually hear from him again in the events of that night. At this point, Peter had been following Jesus for three years. He was one of Jesus' closest disciples, part of the inner circle. He loved Jesus, but he was also very ambitious and overly confident in himself. Like I said, he loved Jesus. Jesus had changed his life. But if Peter was going to be a disciple, he was going to be the best disciple. He would be the most committed, the most devoted, the most courageous, the most passionate, most vocal, most obedient, most loyal. He was very happy for Jesus and all the others to know that he was the best. In fact, on more than one occasion, he was told off for arguing with the others about who would be the best and the greatest. He wanted to prove that he was better than all the others, that he loved Jesus so much more. And so on this night, in his mind, this was the opportunity that he would have to prove it by dying to try and save Jesus if he had to. A lot had changed for Peter, but there was still something that needed to change, something fundamental. So, sure enough, in the early hours of the next morning, after Jesus had been arrested, he followed along at a distance, warming himself by a charcoal fire in the temple courtyard, and he was recognised by someone. Three times he was challenged as to whether he knew Jesus, and three times he did exactly what Jesus said he would. He denied him. And immediately when the cock crowed, Jesus looked right at him from a distance and Peter realised what he'd done and he broke down and wept. He just couldn't believe it. I wonder if that resonates with you. Maybe as you think back now, you've had a moment of going, oh no, what have I done? Have you ever made big promises to yourself or to other people, even I swear to God, of what you will do for them or for him or won't do for them or for him? Maybe you find yourself in a circle saying, this time I will, but you don't or this time I won't, and you do. But what do you do with that? Maybe I'm speaking to someone really personal, or God is. Your struggle is that you can believe Jesus has forgiven you for your sins and failures before you knew him, but what about now? And if you're watching this and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I've got great news for you. If you ask him to come, if you choose to follow him, turning away from everything you know to be wrong, he will forgive you today. But then there's someone else here thinking, what do I do when I feel like I've blown it after I've started following Jesus? Does that mean that it's now all over for you? Maybe you've heard about this thing called the unforgivable sin, and you're wondering, have I blown it that bad? 
Well, the question is, what happened to Peter? Let's find out. Fast forward a few weeks, Jesus had been crucified to pay the price for our sins and to prove that he really is God, he was raised again. And the rumour spread that he was alive. Jesus appeared to them twice already, but now comes the moment when Peter and Jesus would talk again. Now, we're in John chapter 21. John was there too when it happened, and you can see that when you read this. The disciples have just had breakfast with Jesus, sitting around a charcoal fire, noticed that. And Peter and Jesus have their first one-to-one -one conversation since Peter told Jesus that he would never deny him. I wonder, how would you have been feeling if you were Peter? Apprehensive? Nervous about what Jesus would say? Let's take a look. It says this in verse 15 of John 21. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Do you see what's happening here? Jesus has brought Peter right back to the moment of his denial around the charcoal fire. And three times he asked Peter if he loves him. One for every time he denied Jesus. It's another chance and another chance and another chance. Jesus had not come to give Peter a telling off, but come to give him an opportunity. And he comes personally to give Peter, who now feels like the worst disciple, the opportunity to publicly affirm his love for Jesus. And for every time Peter answers, Jesus rebuilds, restores and renews the calling on his, on his life. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. In effect, Jesus is saying to Peter, this isn't really about you at all. Get over yourself. It's not about spiritual heroics or impressive acts of devotion. It's not even about the things that you say you will do or won't do for me. Stop trying to impress me. You don't need to. Jesus is like, I'm not disillusioned with you, Peter. I was under no illusions about you when I called you. And it's like he's saying, you say you love me. That's all I need to know. And that's all you need to know. If you really love me, then love and serve those that I will give to you. But there's a bit more going on in this story. Allow me to go kind of Greek geek on you. You see, in the Greek, which in the, uh, this book is written, there are several words for love. There are two different ones used here, phileo and agape. Phileo is brotherly, sisterly love and affection. And there's agape, which is sacrificial love. Agape is used in the Bible to talk about the love that God has for us. It's the kind of love that led Christ to lay down his life for us. So let's do this in the Greek. Jesus says to Peter, do you agape me more than these? Now remember, agape love is laying your life down kind of love. Also remember, Peter said to Jesus the night he was arrested, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. So you would expect him to say, yes, Lord, I agape you, right? But he doesn't. Something has changed because he answers, Lord, you know I phileo you. Again, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you agape me? Again, Peter says, Lord, you know I phileo you. It's like he's saying, I can't agape you. I know I can't, and you know I can't. I can't love you the way that I want to, even though I thought I could. The best I can do is admire you, to love you like a brother, but I cannot lay my life down for you. And Lord, you already know that. And then final time, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you phileo me? And this time Peter's hurt, it's just so painful. And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know I phileo you. Then Jesus says this, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. In other words, Jesus is saying, right now you can't love me in the way that you said you would and in the way that in your best moments you hope to be able to. But one day when you are ready, you will be able to love me like that. And I'll give you grace for it, but not until you need it. And historical tradition tells us that about 30 years later, Peter was executed in Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero for refusing to renounce his faith in Jesus. And that the sentence for him was that he would be crucified. But Peter said, please don't do that. I don't deserve that. 
I don't deserve to die in the way that my Lord died. Please, can I be crucified upside down? And he was. And they stretched out his hands, and that's how he died, in a way that glorified God. So, if you feel unworthy, you are, we all are, but we are loved anyway, even if you feel like you've blown it. You have, I have, but we're loved anyway, just like Peter. Through this conversation, Jesus completely restores Peter. It's amazing. Three times he gently identifies and addresses Peter's failure. Three times he publicly identifies and affirms Peter's genuine love for him. And three times he recommissioned Peter to demonstrate that love by loving and serving those that belong to Jesus. And finally, he brings Peter right to the beginning of where it all started for him, to the heart of what it means to be a disciple. And it is never anything more or anything less than this. He simply says, follow me. Now, I'm like you. I know when we first encounter Jesus and experience his love, it's very normal for us to respond by making big claims about what kind of a person we now will be and what kind of things we now will do or not do because of the love that we now have for him. Like Peter, this may even continue for a few years and even initially bear lots of fruit. You might make strong and fast progress as a follower of Jesus, but there must come a moment when it all comes crashing down because that kind of faith is a faith that is still based on us. It's about what we will do and how well we will do it. And it is faith in us, not Jesus. Jesus did not come and say, believe in yourself. He said, believe in me. In a moment, we're gonna take the opportunity to pray. I'm gonna lead us through an ancient form of prayer where we're going to imagine that Jesus has come to speak to us just like he did with Peter. But I wanna tell you about my story. You see, this is one of my favorites in the Bible because I resonate with Peter. I've lived my whole life trying to be the best. The fear of not getting straight A's at A-level gave me insomnia for months at the age of 17. Anything less than a first at uni felt like total failure. At the end of my graduate program at work, I won the award for most competitive graduate. The year I won the High Achiever Award at our sales and marketing conference was the best in my life. And the year later, when I didn't get it, when I thought that I would, it was the worst. I thought that when I came to faith and later started working for a church, I would leave all of that behind. Oh my goodness, I was so wrong. Those same competitive, jealous feelings that I had in my sales staff meetings, I brought to my church staff meetings. I had to be the best, pray more, worship more, read the Bible more, share the gospel more. Now, there were many great things from that time. I made a lot of progress as a follower of Jesus. But about two years ago, it began to unravel. Various things didn't go the way I hoped and wanted. And there were a couple of situations I did not handle well, and it was very painful. The big promises and ambitions about what I was going to achieve for God seemed to completely collapse. I'd been so sure of myself, and yet I now felt like I didn't even love Jesus at all. I felt like I'd totally blown it, and it was all over for me. And yet, as I've been praying and wrestling through the months, I've slowly begun to realise that this isn't about how much I love God, but how much He loves me. Then on the 18th of January this year, a member of our staff team here at church shared what she felt God was saying to me, and she had no idea what I was wrestling with at the time. She said, Tim, I believe that God is saying that there is still a part of you that needs to die, and that is your need to be the best at everything. She was so right, and I realised I actually don't need to be the best at anything. The good news of Jesus is this. When we are even at our absolute worst, Jesus loved us and died for us on the cross. I'm already loved. I've got nothing to lose and nothing to prove. So maybe you're in that moment right now, in the wrestling, when you've not been able to live up to the expectations you have set for yourself, maybe you feel deep down that you've completely blown it, that you're not really good enough, but you've been hanging on. Maybe you've been in that place for days or weeks or months or years or even your whole life. Well, just like Peter, Jesus wants to speak to you today to bring you back to perfect restoration. So we're going to finish now by doing a very simple prayer exercise. And I just want to invite you, wherever you are, just to take a moment to close your eyes and to relax. And when you're ready, we're just gonna invite Jesus to come and be with you and to imagine him coming to you in your mind. Okay, don't rush this. Picture him. Okay, he's gonna come and meet us where we're at. He doesn't, it doesn't have to be on a beach, but where you want to meet with him. So let's just do that. Let's just take a moment. Just close your eyes, just relax.
and take a moment to picture Jesus coming to you in your mind. Just say, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus, come and speak to us Lord. Just in that moment, look at him. What do you see? I see him coming with a, a smile on his face and kindness in his eyes. What is it for you? And as you're with him, what is it that you've been carrying all this time? What are the regrets? What are the failures that you want to lay down before him? Take a moment to bring those to him now. And as you do that, what is it that he wants to say to you? And finally, let him ask you the question, do you love him? If your answer is yes, then nothing else really matters. And then hear him say to you now, follow me. Amen.